You know, we should do these things quite often, because although I've been specifically asked to talk about um, Spectrum Next, I was just thinking, looking around here, there's so much history, and a lot of it I was involved with, and I can remember it, and you know, I can dig out things to show people. So, I don't know, you guys think about some other topic as well, you know, what was it like in the, I don't know, King's Parade days, or ZX80 days, and what have you. So, um, you need a lot of references when you're designing something. When I'm talking about design here, I'm generally talking about industrial design, okay? And um, retro is a really interesting thing. Um, you know, what, 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 why would you want to do another product, especially one that's been successful? You're trying to recreate some sort of success that's already gone. Well, why would you do that? And, you know, you don't even know why it was so su successful, maybe. And um, so you need some really strong references to be able to argue your case during the development process or maybe when you finish the design of why it's like this, you know, why you did that and why you definitely didn't do the other, okay? You've got to have references. So I just want to go back for a few seconds, really, to um, something I did a while ago. Is this going to work? Right, okay, some of you will have seen these. Uh, as I, say, I won't dwell on them because they're, they're reference points. This was, a, this was a personal study. So, you know, whether you agree or disagree with this sort of thing, there are some obvious things there. So it, this was a question of, how would the Spectrum be today? You know, what would we have continued that was a really good Spectrum thing? What would we have got rid of that was not a good Spectrum or Sinclair kind of uh, piece of hardware or software? And then there's all the other technologies that are evol evolving in parallel, although in the Sinclair days we, we evolved, invented, if you like, some of our own technologies in order to achieve the results we were after, which was namely trying to achieve something that worked reasonably well for as little money as possible. And Jim was just saying earlier how important it was that we managed these price breaks because so many people would have never got into it, you know, so something like um, Commodore up 400 pounds 5,000 years ago, it's like two grand today, isn't it? It's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, oh, okay, okay. So, it, pretty obvious, really. So, you've got, uh, you know, you've got gaming keys, because that's what the Spectrum pretty well ultimately became. You can still use it as a computer. You've got a touchscreen display. It's thinner. There's a, the, the, you know, there's the resemblance of the original Spectrum. But I want... That's just how it could have been, okay, if things had carried on. Uh, and I just wanted to plant that seed with you. Now, sometime later, I met this guy, the, ha the handsome one on the left. Um, this was down at St Pancras, and uh, Henrique had just contacted me saying, hey, how do you fancy working on this new project of mine? And uh, I hadn't met Victor at the time. So um, it was irresistible. He'd seen some other work. And, um, and so we had a meet. And these are some of the issues that um, we really needed to understand. Um, you know, otherwise, you don't know what you're doing. When you're designing a product for the first time, it's usually very clear. Is it, I think designing for retro is harder than designing for anything else, because what is retro, you know, and everyone here will have a, their own understanding of it. So, for example, do we design a solution from the period? How it would have been if we were doing a Spectrum Next then? And then fast forward it in our little time machine to today. Or do we design a solution of today using all of technologies, today's technology and what have you? You know, whichever route you take, it's going to be a very, very different result in every sense. You know, it's going to operate differently. You know, the user experience is going to be different. The industrial design, if you like, or the aesthetics will be different. Then we had this other question of, well, which spectrum? We had certainly three, three, three to choose from. <laughs> there we go. I'll, I'll bring my own kit next time. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you, you, you know, arguably, this is the one. Um, this seems to be the one that everyone has somehow fallen in love with. But you've also got that. And you've also got that. Um, now, it's quite clear that Henrique really wanted to follow 
the plus casing, more styling. Um, I wasn't going to argue. As far as I was concerned at the time, he's my, you know, I'm his client. Yeah, he's my client. Sorry. And um, so, you know, up to a point, you know, I, I follow what your, your, your goal is although or dream. Although I'll be looking at other things along the way to make sure you haven't forgotten anything I think might be important. Right, here's a really important question. And the answer, surprisingly, is that. Okay, so the Spectrum 128K and plus, I'm talking industrial design terms again here, all came from that because. So that is a true industrial design evolution of the original Spectrum did not occur, and there were a lot of reasons. I, I remember being in our design studio at Sinclair now with Clive Sinclair, Nigel Searle, and there was somebody else, and we were thinking, we've got to do a next generation spectrum. We've got no time. Why didn't they think of that earlier? Uh, what should we do? Well, corporate convenience, fine, self-explanatory. Explanatory. Lack of development time to market was quite an important factor. And we'd invested, by today's money, a million in, in two-shot tooling for the keyboard, you know, because going back to ZX80s, 81, Spectrum, key, keyboards were always criticised for all the reasons you know. Ironically, 30 years later, people love them and they want the same again. Great. Um, you know, so we had this enormous investment and just take modern current car design. Let's just take Audi, okay. When you're on the motorway, Audi comes up behind you, you don't know whether it's an A1 or an A5. Okay, the difference in the two cars is monumental. But the fronts are the same, and you don't get any reference of scale exactly when you're driving along like that. So they've sadly corporatized everything aesthetically, so you can't really tell what the differences are. And, and I think that's the decision we sort of took at Sinclair. We're, we're just going to look... Um, we're going to use the QL keyboard. Um, and that really, that really sets, that sets the bar for what the rest of the product can look like, okay? Which I think is a bit of a shame, but it leads on to this spectrum next, question mark. Well, maybe we can address that now. Why do I keep going the wrong way? Okay. So, as always, the first thing you look at with designing computers is um, the keyboard. So you're going to choose your technology. Why am I going to choose this technology over that technology? Do I have any cost issues, production uh, issues? Then there's the layout, size, shape, thickness, aesthetics. And you gradually work your way through these, and you come up and you decide, this is the keyboard design, OK? And it is, it's the fundamental mechanical aspect of the whole product because it determines so much. So. Um, as I said, Henrique decided he wanted to go with the, um, you know, the Spectrum Plus, the 128K, and what have you. So we started looking at, um, well, where did we stick the keys? I can't remember. What's, what's the stagger of the keyboard? You know, what's the size of a key and all that sort of stuff? And we sort of got into it, started producing things. But then the thing is, you can't just copy it. But how do you make it slightly different? You know, square keys are square keys with little round finger bowls on. So. I think it, with a lot of Sinclair stuff, it's, it's trying to be meticulous with your attention to detail. You've, you've got not, you, there's not much going for you. It's a tiny little palette, this product. Not like a car. It's got a grill and lights and doors and windscreens, lots of th scope for things. So pretty well the same as the QL keys, but I really wanted to shallow off those finger bowls. In those days, people were worried about the length of fingernails of typists. You know that word, typists, fingernails? You know, people don't have secretaries anymore, but in those days they did, and so the finger bowl was quite high up. So this is very flush, just to just to change it enough, just to bring it forward a bit in time. Remember, we're trying to bring it forward in time all the time. And then again, we don't really need to redesign anything. It's you know, in the Sinclair days, if I'm calling those. You had to design stuff from scratch. There was nothing there that would fit the bill. But today, we're looking at evolved technologies. You know, these things are made by the million. 
uh, per month. So you just pick whatever you think is the most applicable to your need off the shelf. A little bit of detail there. But interesting, if this is quite a high level of detail. We haven't even started looking at what the machine's going to look like yet. Okay, some things you've really got to, a bit like the foundations on a house. You know, you've really got to have it pointing all in the right direction at the right level and all the rest of it before you make your start. So it went into a fair bit of detail. And again, will the graphics fit on? And interesting on the forums, I'm sure a lot of you have seen some of the... Uh, I, I love putting, posting this stuff up on the forums. You're just going to get a thousand responses. For, oh, no, you're joking, or whatever. <laughs> Anyhow, so... Uh, the other scary thing is with CAD tools, it looks like you've got a finished product there, doesn't it? But that certainly is not a finished product. Right, now this was the, t this was the toughie. Um, Victor and um, Enrique just thought they were going to go with the, um, the old 48K board, which, as you know, went into the 128 and all the rest, mechanically speaking. Add a few modern connectors on. Um, and then hopefully... You can shove that back in an old spectrum, any old spectrum. Well, you know, how's that going to happen? You've got new connectors all over the place. Then I discovered, oh, it's okay if they get a drill and a file. You know, I'm used to high volume manufacturing design. I'm not used to the customer getting out the file on his vacuum cleaner you know, to make something else fit. So, okay, if, if you say so, you know. Um, and then there's a the classic conundrum where, you know, over 35 years, you look at, just look at connector technology, how it's changed, how it's evolved, how it's become smaller and smaller and smaller, and how that affects the product in such a good way. I mean, think of the days of, I don't know, D connectors, for example, you know, a couple of nuts and bolts on the back so the thing doesn't fall off. I mean, it's just hilarious, isn't it, when you look at, a, you know, an HDMI or a mini USB or whatever. So there were things like that, or do we... Um, go with a new PCB, which is really what I want to do. You, you don't want to be using old stuff. It's going to be a nightmare. Because all of this affects the form of the, um, the product. You know, it's driven by these choices that you're going to make right at the beginning, and you just can't like the concrete slab of your house. If you decide, do you know what, the sun rises further over to the uh, east than I thought, let's just move it around a bit. Well, you, you can't, can you? You know, you, you, it's... Um, ah, that's the term, isn't it? Casting concrete. Oh, well. Anyhow, the first idea, right, so thinnest possible solution, again, another classic Sinclair must-have, you know, along with others like black or whatever. Do I keep fading in and out of this? It's quite sensitive. Um, okay, this is quite interesting. So on here, I'm trying to go as thin as possible. So we've got these big, fat, chunky D connectors from, you know, the time of the Flintstones, and I've shoved those over to one side from underneath the keyboard because if you put them under the keyboard, the product's going to be thicker. But um, it's quite a long product, isn't it? And it's starting to look a bit QL-ish. <laughs> uh, but, you, you know, you've got to try these things out. All right, that was the other one, minimum footprint. You know, another crucial Sinclair ingredient, so footprint, you know what I mean by that. Um, how do I make it as small as possible in the X and Y dimensions? So, okay. So this is the keyboard. Remember, it all goes back to the keyboard, the original keyboard design, that's sacrosanct. And we put the minimum amount of material, mechanically speaking, that we can put around the product on all four sides. Right, well you can see, now I've got to think about the PCB. At the moment, in my mind, I don't know if it's going to be the original PCB or a totally new one or a hybrid, although Victor and Hugo think they know what it's going to be. I'm, I'm not sure yet, although, you know, obviously they'll, they'll have the last shout. Now, just flipping that over, you can see the spectacular effect that everything has on everything else. So, you see the huge cutouts. This is, so this is a bespoke PCB, current day connectors, what we'd have done with the D connectors, I've no idea. We'd have probably just had a little box off the side that you can plug your joysticks into or whatever. Now, can you see the big cutouts in the PCB? I mean, they are to give clearances for the flip-up legs. Yeah. You know, industrial designers 
designed the PCB layout and where the holes are and the screws and that's all going to go. And this is why, because the integration between the circuit and the stuff on the outside is just spectacularly tight. And again, you can see we've got the SD card off to, to the outside world, and it's all looking good. Uh, view from the rear, all looking quite minimal, footprint issue, cute. You know, every time I read that slide, I can read disgusting. Does anyone else read that? <laughs> uh, right, okay, so this is another visual mechanism for getting around uh, things that are bulkier than you really want them to be. Just go back one step. You know, Spectrum Plus and the 128 were big, fat, chunky machines. They weren't really going to Sinclair products, in my view, you know, compared to the ZX81, the ZX80, and the first Spectrum, the Z88. All the calculators, they're all very thin, elegant things. The Z, uh, and the Spectrum Plus was a thick, chunky thing, but we know the reasons for that. Okay, so, um, how the wedge works, okay, if you see, on the left, you've got the PCB orientated the normal way up with the connectors on the top, and the keyboard area on top. If you go to a wedge shape, you turn the PCB upside down, and because you've got some control over the, uh, a lot of the components on the uh, PCB, and you stuff all the big ones at the back anyhow, because that's what they're allowed with the connectors, so that's where you, you put them. It allows you to drop the front. Uh, and this is, a, this is an illusionary thing, okay. I'm scribbling around to see maybe what shape we could get out of that. So, from the back end, you can see you've got quite a, a deep back end. We've got the uh, fat old connectors in. But from the side, it's quite interesting. Now, you know, well, there's the aesthetic consideration, and there's, hmm, but it's always angled up, isn't it? I, like a flat product that I can angle up. If I want to angle it up or not, I don't know. Yeah, you can see how the sculpting works there. And you can see the effect of the SD card in this image on the right there, and all the bits and pieces, the pad bits of power bulging. existing connectors that we're going to use in the original locations and with a few other connectors located where we think they're going to go. Uh, and this is pre-stretch goal stuff, which we'll come on to later. Now you can see we want these tilt feet, so they've got to go either side of the PCB. Suddenly the left and the right hand side of the PCB you can't see the outside world. So we can't put connectors down there. Uh, I've got another half dozen connectors to put on there for various bits and pieces. Yeah. Joysticks. Um, where are they going to go? Um, keyboard. Shove it to the left, that's where they always seem to go. It looks better. It's a Sinclair thing now, isn't it? So, anyway, we worked up a few designs. There's a really. Try to deep see the spectrum flash on the right. I really tried to look for some of the early sketches I did on this because it was so difficult to get it to look right, as you can see on there. Um, and that, uh, that soon then manifested itself. Uh, funnily enough, it was one of the most enjoyable aspects of implementing the rainbow. It really was a case of, oh, how's it going to be? Absolutely nice. Carte blanche. Don't mind the cost in production, we'll figure out a way. <laughs> So, looking good, you know. Um, right. Where's the carpet? Mm -hmm. Choices. Okay. Right. Now, the 
one on the left is the first one I showed you, which is the was at the time the thinnest we could use with standard connectors. The one on the right is the smallest footprint and using modern technology, current day technology, but look at the difference. I mean spectacularly different. I mean then selecting them easy the, the long QL one disappeared obviously. Leaving these three, um, the one in the middle is what we've got now as you probably recognise. I'll just go through some more images because there others are more informative. Yeah, I just find the real ones more informative because they tell me even more about what's going on inside. So again, even at that stage we haven't really decided, or maybe I haven't decided, um, you know, how we're going to deal with all these different connectors and what have you. Also, you can see the name, it's still called Spectrum Plus, and we've got it off on the bottom left hand side there. It's quite nice looking back. Well, if anybody wants any of these images, just let me know. Um, the Let's make it white. We have the same and simple. I would come and go. Black. Mm. Okay. We'll try all the colours. Yeah. We'll try all these colours out. White. Uh, oh, that's fantastic. And the last minute is. Oh well, we'll go with the black then. So this is all part of the down selection process, by the way, looking at the other designs you've got, zooming in some of the details that you think are particularly nice about them, uh, which could be, you know, someone's better in white or whatever. I'm just going through it to help you make a decision about downsizing further. I mean, for example, look at the difference, the contrast effect of um, the, the four um, you know, rainbow stripes on white, so different to being on black. You know, I wouldn't say that after all words, it's just different. The cleanliness in white. Although with white, there are other things to think about. I think you've got to have a polished surface finish, otherwise, it's going to look really grubby very quickly. That was fun. Let me step on the side here. Again, you can see. Um, the joystick connectors, yeah, where's the Raspberry Pi board? And, well, it didn't exist then. When we saw that tape, I don't know if anyone here was responsible for it, but I don't know where I saw it online somewhere. Got our direction sorted, that's the one we're going for. <laughs> and with the original spectrum PCB profile. Mm. So, how are we going to make all those connectors on the left and right hand side, some of which don't even exist yet, meet the outside world when all we've got is a front and a back, and really you don't want anything on the front? Although a lot of joystick people would argue against that. that is. So, here we are, we've got our spectrum PCB. You want stuff in where we expect to put it. A few new connectors are coming in. You can see the feet or legs on the left and right hand side, but you know, this is where the daughter board came in for the, you know, the SD card. Because if you buy the, the board on its own, you've got, you've probably know you've got the SD card already on the board, but if somebody buys in the Spectrum Plus case, it's, you know, I can't, get, I can't reach it. So we have to do a, a tweak on the production line and then put in a separate board connect to that board. Starting to get some of the detail into it. So it's a little ribs along the top there. That's really just a mimic of ventilation slots that we had on the, the Plus and the 128. They don't have to be there, you know, but it's... Remember where the products are so small and plain, there's not a big canvas to use the, the metaphor. 
you're looking for details, excuses for details, you know, but to work with them nicely. At that time, I'm sorry guys, it wasn't my decision, we were looking at uh, eliminating the uh, spectrum um, flashes on the side there, the rainbows. I can see we've got connectors with no ball. <laughs> Oh, it's a great thing with cat, you know, you just shove everything in there and you see where you are. Okay, this is quite an early iteration by now. Um, you know, we've, uh, there's a stretch goal which is to stuff in the Raspberry Pi board. Uh, okay, what's one of those? Okay, what does that again go? And the back of the product's full, we can't get to the left and the right. So we started off at the front. And you can see on the left the um, the SD board, filter board's working quite nicely. Yeah. Okay, right. Also, you can see a, a, a joystick that's coming in. Well, there's only one at the moment, I don't know. Some of the switches have been removed from the back end now on the left hand side. Right, that's a really bad solution. Okay, now we've got two, um, the joysticks are now on the, on the uh, SD filter board. On a corner, I mean, that would be spectacularly horrible. But often you've got to do things like this to point out to people like that we have a problem with this, and this is just not going to work. Let me show you how it's going to be in reality. The other thing with the um, joysticks is that um, I mean, these monumentally large, outdated um, connector shells. And there isn't a product height for them. You know, if you put it in the front of the product, the keyboard is in the way. If you put it to the left, the keyboard is in the way. If you put it to the right, the rainbow stripes are in the way. You know, the requirement came in too late. It should have been in at the beginning, so you can come up with a concept that embraces all these things that you need to have. You can't just have stuff halfway through and hope it's going to work because you're really going to compromise the design. Uh, you can see there the LED has been created for the full spectrum things that could be good. It may still come in another iteration. And again, you see that uh, this is a side, uh, side view. And it shows you the sort of problem. It's not just getting the connectors in, it's getting their plugs. The plugs are often bigger than the connectors. And the plug had to go under the front edge of the board, uh, of the product. And at this stage, we don't want to be making the product you know, two, three, four, five millimeter deep, but when we've gone through all that trouble to make it thin in the first place, you saw the down selection process. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to go up again. And, and also, in cat terms, it's a nightmare. You're too far progress. You, you know, it's almost like starting from scratch. Yuck. Yeah. Little board, doors board on the right there, you see for the um, washing in. Much debate down at the front, and um, Victor Lessing managed to find um, a lower profile set of deconnectors and plastics. Uh, but what it meant was that we had to drop the board height of the spectrum. So the two boards are now dissimilar heights, which is, you could say, well, so what? Okay, but you, you know, it's not like everything the same unless you really got to change it. Mm -hmm. See those little blobs in red. That's me now starting to think how are we going to assemble this PCB? Because remember, although there's going to be a new board in, in the sense it's fresh manufacture, fresh layout, a lot of its origins and sizes and dimensions of certain things are were created over 35 years ago. Um, and their functionality is redundant to us really. They're things that we don't want to have. So I think the red are just the screw holes of holding the PCB to the case and the average and blue ones are how we hold the case together. But just look at the blue one at the top in the middle. I've had, in order to get the case to be strong enough when it's all built up, I've had to put a new 
well, it might sound unimportant, but I had to put a new big fat hole in the second board. And at that time you're thinking, well, you know, it's a component in the way, a bunch of tracks, it's just too bad, you've got to move it, you know. <laughs> Every time we would sort of um, send PCB drawings and data to one another, bearing in mind we're working digitally, we're working to one's microns in terms of dimension, 13 decimal places or whatever, can't do those two. And so often something would be in the wrong place and this went on and on and on. I could never see the consistency. Anyway, for a long story short, I went down to this place that scans later, scans stuff, and said, well, get an old piece of the spectrum to um, These are the dimensions I want, please tell me what they really are. So I came back to that, and gave that to Victor. This is the reality. Some of these are different to mine. Let loose this gem of information, which was well, the profiles of the spectrum boards varied enormously through their production life. Okay, um, the profile of a PCB is always the slackest, tolerable dimension on, on the product. Okay, you never, you rarely dimension to the profile of the board. You always dimension everything from the whole center, because the whole center is a far more accurate. So. Sometimes when it would fit, it's because Victor had dimensioned to a whole centre. And when it wouldn't fit, he might have just happened to have dimensioned it to the edge of a PCB. But which edge and which version of the PCB, you know, one from, you know, issue A, B, C, or whatever. So that was an absolute revelation. So I said, look, we've got to establish, remember Concord, French and English, I mean, nightmare, isn't it? You know, you've got to establish reference points, you know, commonality. We're going to establish a dating point, and it's going to be a hole on the board. It doesn't matter which one, and everything grows from that to this. And after that, everything was spot on. But um, another example of trying to work with old stuff, you know, it makes me new. Right, look at the, uh, the RPI board. It's now over at the back. Um, I think this is the one of the most spectacularly tightest the squeezing wheel we've ever done on any product. And again, we asked for samples of plugs and when they came in, it was, and we thought it would fit there, but when you put all the plugs in, there isn't space for them. They're banging to each other. You see how high it is in the product. That's why we ended up with the bulge. Can you see the bulge to the side of the ribs? For well, on the edge here, I can't remember. No, it's the edge here, I can't remember. The one that's forcing us to have a power bulge, is it? Is it, is it, is it, it is yeah. it's on the edge here, right? Yeah. It is the edge here, right? yeah. So we've had to grow this little power bulge so that we can actually get the plug in, which is a bit of a shame. Um, at this stage, we're starting to look at how the um, plastic break up, I say break up, I mean, how it can actually produce separate parts that A, can be moldable, that will come out of the mold to uh, that will assemble together in the way you would expect it to assemble. And, and it can be quite a complicated operation. So if you look at this view, uh, case up and below delivered in two different shades, and you can see the, what we call a part line, a split line, or whatever you can see, is obviously where the two colours meet. Um, look what happens when you come to a connector. Um, we couldn't go straight across because um, you wouldn't have been able to withdraw parts of the tool on the D-shaped connectors. You would on one side, but not on the other side, because uh, you would have had a, an undercut. So we had to joggle the part line, bring it up, and bring it to a point the widest part of the connector. Now on the back, it's different. The whole of the back of the product is a separate moving piece on the mold tool, which just pulls everything off. So whatever shape you want on the back, in terms of the connector aperture, 
that you can have when we look at the we meet. Uh, just in parts in the back and the front and the sides are polished, just like on the original 48 came the spectrum. But just a quick sketch to show you, you know, this is just fiddling around with the edge connector. Trying to get some basic details so that, you know, there's months to come and to plug something in the edge connector. It's actually going to fit. There's the bulge, yeah. Um, well, that's without the bulge, so you have a notch. Which might not offend some of you, it certainly offends me, and it's just so unnecessary, and it was too late to make the product thicker. Uh, so, sorry, just a bulge over there. Oh, there's a little um, plastic blue guys going in. Now, it's difficult to know what to make those out of, because as you know, on the original spectrum, well, all spectrums, it's pressed metal. But it's too small, pressed metal, so they're injection molded in self color polish finish should be nice. This is a complicated area. Um, again, all the separate bones and what have you. And again, the splitting and separating the plastics parts. Yeah. It's quite difficult in areas like that because you've got so much happening. And you've always got to think of the assembly operation. You know, I've got a button that's got to fit through a hole. So it's not a z-axis operation, it's a sort of wandering operation, which might be fine, but you might have something at the other end of the board that doesn't allow that. So that's quite a lot to think about. Right. This is this always happens on those products. You're getting towards the end and things aren't fitting. Uh, we didn't tell you about this connector or that connector. We've got to change something. See these scoops in the plastic? They are to give clearance. This is the, um, the connection of the SD or daughter board, whichever you want to call it, to the, to the motherboard. And uh, they were quite chunky connectors, much bigger than we allowed for. So the only way was to thin out the plastics in that particular area. You can't always thin out the plastics, you don't always have the luxury, but we were lucky this time, so it just worked out fine. This is a little light guide for the LED. So the block at the top there is representing an LED. And, I mean, some of these pictures you might have seen on, on, on the forum, but uh, just a general assembly. And then, this is always a great time. Um, sending your 3D files off for manufacture of what we call SLAs or the stereolithographic process which gives you uh, access, <coughs> access, if you like, of the real thing. It's the closest you're going to get before tooling. Okay, so they're pretty active, pretty spot on, they're fragile. And they give you a lot of information. We always, we always uh, get PCBs on um, SLAs as well because we want to understand for sure that the assembly of them is going to be working. It's very easy to design a product and all the bits come and then you realise you can't assemble some of it. Because you know, on CAD it's quite an isolated environment. And the level of stereolithography today, as you can see, is just spectacular. I mean, we didn't have this in the Sinclair days, there's nothing like this. Yeah, it just has to be. It seems like quite as complicated, I suppose. And there's just an interesting comparison. I think. It's the same distance front to back as it should be because it's got the same board. Um, but obviously not back to right. And this is where we are today. Now, how this all comes out in terms of reality is down to meticulous attention on tool making the injection molding and the assembly and the general manufacture of the product. You can produce a set of 3D files and 2D drawings and specify them until you blue in the face. But it doesn't mean you're going to get a great product. There are tool makers and there are tool makers. And there are quite a lot of processes through the tool making phase where you're able to check on certain things that are going in the direction you want them to go in 
rather than uh, election measure until they can want it again because it's more convenient for him. That would be it. Uh, I'd love to have shown you more, but history is such that there isn't more to show you just yet. We'll just not two links. So, um, yeah. Any questions? I think Jim and I are on for a sort of QA really. Yeah, I, it's been really enjoyable. I, I, yeah, I'm really happy to say. And uh, one of the most exciting things for me was trying to get that blend. Or, remember I said the original spectrum would never evolve. In my view, it was just it became QLized. Um, just trying to get a bit of feel of that into the new one. And I think it's just that curve, you know. Right? Um, so is it too so late to get those LEDs back on the rainbow? Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be really nice. <laughs> it, it, it would. The reason I was given was um, just cost. And I don't know enough about electronics and the firmware and stuff. I mean, in terms of hardware, it's nothing. Yeah, it's all shit. So, um, I mean, it's not sure I was talking about retro. Can you do a retro on a retro? Yes, you could retro fit it to your retro products. Yeah. Um, you could retro fit something. I mean, I'm not suggesting well, that's the answer. Not just mm. Well, I, I don't know, Jim, you've got Victor's telephone number. I should have put it at the end here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? All four inserts are the same, aren't they? They are. Uh, well, yes and no. Um, yes in the sense that they are from the outside. No in the sense that um, in production terms, if you've got a number of items that are the same or look the same and are different colours or go in different places, we have to put these little things in which we call pokey devices. And it's something that physically forces that you can only put that one in that place, otherwise they'll get it wrong in the production line. So on the production line, we didn't have Pokiokis in it, you know, the red would be where the blue is sometimes. That, that, that's the sort of problem. I was going to say, you manufacture a clear one that takes an LED. <laughs> so and then, I like the you just buy a plug And then, yeah. then, then you've got identical components which cost, which drops your cost, so then it covers yeah, the cost of the Yeah, LED, yeah, so yeah. yeah. What, what was I was, I think I said, the, um, the mechanical side and the electronic side is nothing to, to, to do what you're talking about. It's something to do with how you drive it. Because I had visions of, I plug this thing in and these are sort of things that would have a flashing rainbow or even the sky's the limit if someone loves to come in and it would be fantastic opportunity. And even pre program you know, going around. <coughs> so, you know, going around and around. So, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would imagine as time goes by, you know, we've got 3D files for it, you know, and, you know, just SLA is something clear and the big file and a whole bit bigger. But I don't know how you would connect, well, it's easy enough to connect to it if you want more just a light up, because we've got one LED at the back, haven't we? We just bring some power from that. So, I, I, I don't know, it was never a sort of really, <laughs> well, that's the thing, wasn't it, Jim? No. So, yeah. It was too expensive. Do we have a boat? Are there any octopuses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, is too late. It might be too late. You've got to let somebody develop an aftermarket add on for spectrum. You can't put it all in the first design. <laughs> you could argue, yeah. I would sometimes argue, well, I left these big holes and gaps in the product so you could fill them. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you can hear me. <laughs> Don't feel bad about the pump. I think it makes very ZX80-ish. Okay. I think so. Yeah, I never thought it's about you right. Where else are you going to need the other pump? Well, the other pump. It was a lovely expression. I remember it was uh, one of the manufacturers that introduced me to that. So, I kind of fell over laughing. The other pump. And speaking of the other pump, do you realise that Later on, because the production volumes got so high on ZX80, they 
a, um, a uh, process manufacturing conversion from vacuum forming to injection molding. So the latter ones are injection molded, so plastics will be thicker, they'll have different texture, um, you know, they were quite different. Um, I don't know how many people were necessarily aware of that. But they're just, um, I don't know, they're essential production things that you have to go through. And again, you try and keep it looking the same as you can, but you can't because it's a totally different process. I thought the ZX80, John Penton's design, was very clever. Again, you know, wooden moulds. Yeah. <laughs> they're about 600 quid. Uh, what a great piece of design for. And again, at that time, the, the, there were no memory keyboards. We had the MK14, sure, but no one was really making them apart from the you know, Mattel toys type things. I just thought all the bits go together. Would you like to say anything about EMC considerations? EMC, yeah. Well, on this, I don't know anything about it, so I hope someone's. How to go at it? <laughs> Can we have your telephone number as well? I don't suppose any of you realise who that is at the moment. Tipped up in a ditch, tanker wasn't it? Yeah, we were kept. That's right. Yeah. That, that's right. We were the first one we've seen this truck had gone upside down into a ditch and on fire, and we were trying to lift the cab up here, right? We cut our fingers, and we were really late in getting back, and Jim was amazing. He said, uh, Oh, you know, your girlfriend's going to kill you. So, like, you know, one of our friends in those days, telephone boxes were always vandalized. And, uh, and then Brizzy's car he had a selection of chocolates wrapped up. Do you remember? It was just kind of nasty. Sounds like a bottle. Uh, don't say it's not a track. Probably, yeah. Thinking yeah. yeah. about it. Your car. That was the back form of the finish for the finish. Yes. Yeah. That was hilarious. Well, as I said right at the beginning, there's so much history. It's been great to meet up and have different themes, talk about different things. There are so many, you know, you could imagine it's people like Jimmy as well, rabbiting on for hours, really interesting stuff. But, uh, and, you know, the fact that we're all here today obviously shows some sort of strong, continuing interest for one reason. In fact, I was thinking, it was only five years ago, it was in the 30th celebration at Anglo Ruskin, and who would have thought then that we'd be talking about a new spectrum? Come on, there must be some hard hitting questions on this one. when you start off on something, what are you going to change and what are you going to keep the same and why? And um, I felt that the Sinclair logo needed moving on just a little bit. And also, it's not a Sinclair product. Okay. It's um, somebody else's product. Um, so, kind of, for me, emotionally sort of tied in a little bit changing it slightly. Um, some people love it, some people don't. But again, you know, you could uh, not change other things and people say, I'd like you to change this please. And evolve it. Oh, well you, you want to evolve that bit, but you're not happy for me to evolve this bit. Why is that then? You know, so you give it on this kind of merry-go-round of opinion probably. You know. And again, it's not always engineering, is it? It's not C plus C equals four. It's you are thinking, well, what else? 
other reasons for doing this or doing that in, in a house or in a way. Um, how do you justify one solution over another? Well, it's an art form again, right? It, it, it is. So not yeah. exactly by all the people in the time. Yeah. 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 I think in most cases, yeah, I'm sort of designed to get on with it as long as they don't there. I mean, they produced what you liked in the first place. So, it was interesting. The, um, it was an interview a while ago, and um, there was a particular question. I don't know the question, but I remember the answer, which was something along the lines of, oh, that's right, it was about market research. That's right, we were talking about since that days. And, um, you know, did you do any market research? That sort of thing. You know, so, you know, if you're in the business of cat food or dog food, you might do some market research or washing powder. But this is something completely different. You, you can ask people what they think they want, but I guarantee it will be limited in the sense that it won't necessarily. It's not that it won't be a good idea, but it will be at the exclusion of lots of other ideas. Possibilities, and also it will be at the exclusion of a whole bunch of parameters that they can't possibly know because you haven't told them that you need to know that go into helping you design this product. Fundamentally, the spec: what is it? What's it going to be? What's it going to do? What does it matter if it doesn't do? You know, what's the hierarchy of important things you must have? And you know, when you go through all of that. You very often find there's very little choice on aesthetics or design choices like that. Gosh, you know, we're stuck with this, that's the rest of it. But, um, yeah, and also this Sinclair load adaptation was, um, I think it's the sort of thing Clive might have eventually done. Um, it's funny, really, Clive is obviously a Two sort of things to change, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a change guru. But um, in other areas, he didn't like to make changes. Um, he was always incredibly loyal with his staff. I trust them. The longer you know them, the more I trust them. It's very nice. Um, and some things he just felt he didn't want to change. Um, Probably the Sinclair logo was one of those things, but anyway, it's probably very long way around. I was saying, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you find any of the, um, the other ones that you haven't seen before interesting? You see some of the design, thinking, logic, how we got to where we are. Can you talk a little bit more about the things you said right at the beginning, the imaginary Yeah, that Yes. Um, I was never, I was never totally satisfied with my work on the spectrum, and I could never figure out what it was. And in the end, we just had to go to production with it. You know, I tinker with it, and tinker with it, and you know, look at the questions again. Yeah, I've got the right answers. And um, and this has sort of lived with me for not in a big way, in a big deal. One day I thought I must just sit down and have a crack at the spectrum, but as it would be today. You know, so imagine I'd done that 20 years ago, it would be a different solution, wouldn't it? Because the technology is totally different, we didn't have touch panels, for example. Um, so really it's just looking at where we are with communicating devices. I mean, let's just use the classic uh, uh, iPad, okay? So um, there's your user interface. Um, we've, got to, we've got to have that. Everything is done through that, but it's a games product as well. So you've got to have proper mechanical console type joystick and buttons and all the rest of it. Um, somewhere to plug in games, which shows them at the back. Um, and I, I, I wanted to try and keep to the original spectrum shape as much as possible. So. But I found all I could do was really compress it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in the Sinclair days, we were always fighting 
height, you know, so the TV modulator, which is the biggest component by far, would always go at the back. Um, because you can work with bulk from the back down to the front. You'd never put it in the front, you'd be reaching over it as well. You have know, monster components to do with in those days, which you don't really have anymore. You just be power supplied, you can sweep a power supply converter to some some old iron thing with copper wound around the way to the top. It's just like a spectacular improvements on weight and size. You mentioned um, that you had to use the original board size. Mm. Why? Mm. Does it doesn't matter what was inside. I mean, is that a retro thing? Do you think that, that people care? Um, no. Um, you mentioned it several times in your presentation, you can't stick with the original board size, and I'm thinking it, it wasn't a big deal for me. I mean, that's the outside of the big deal. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, Thanks. I don't think the light that goes in with the original cats. So, so people, people do like that. I mean, I don't oh, know. Yeah. For me, it wasn't a big deal. No, no, I mean, what you're bearing in mind is I'm responding to what yeah, people that were wanting. Saying, yeah. yeah, and I mean, it would be full of conflicts that are, some of them are impossible to. Find a solution to. Um, <laughs> so, on the board, there's the, the board only option, and I'm, 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 I haven't done an issue with that. No, it's just you sit in your design. After you've done the keyboard, the next thing you had to consider was that you had to use the same size PC book. That's right. The original size PC yeah. and You've said it several times, and I'm thinking, why was that a constraint? Why was that an issue? Well, right, OK. The, um, Cause the components are all so much smaller these days. You could have used a half a half width one that would live at the back, and just, you don't need the volume of areas. Do you? I don't think you need uh, the space. You. There's a lot of connectors on the products, and you've got to have external faces to get to those connectors, and the back face is all that the original Spectrums had, and it was more than 50 percent of the requirement. So you would have to grow, you'd have to grow the, um, the PCB left and right in order to reach the outside world, so you could put connectors on it, which is why. If you use the old board, you can't do that. You've then got to add daughter boards and connectors, which is expensive. And it's incredibly inelegant. Um, I think for us, it was, in engineering terms, that was the hardest bit, trying to create a brand new product. But hey, you can still put the PCB on its own in a product that was designed 35 years ago. It's my new journey. It's just, it's just a recipe for disaster. There's a thousand things going to go wrong. You know, there are historic type things that you never ever want on your product that you have on the old one. You know. So, um, I'm not sure if I'll answer your question fully then. I would have thought, directly, I mean, the thing that appealed to me was the fact that I'd still be able to put my old peripherals into the next. Yes. So, that, that was actually what sold it for me. Yeah. The keyboard yeah. looks beautiful, it's really nice, it's a beautiful yeah. design. The fact that it can still use interface well in the microdrive. Yeah. You know, that, that still allows it to be part of the house. Yes. I think to take I think we've achieved that. It, it it's it's trying to fit that computer, that PCB back into an old spectrum so I'll buy an old one. Yeah. Yeah. But that was the yeah. bit I was just surprised that that, that was actually a consideration. Uh, I was surprised that was you even considered that. Well me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I would have um, well, the answer to that was people would be happy to file holes in their old spectrum. And, uh, it's the, the, the reason why we wanted it to be able to fit back into the old original case was because if the Kickstarter failed, there was a backup plan. Uh, yeah. And, uh, that's the reason.
Um, yes, yeah, I mean, I was incredibly lucky when I look back, well, even when it was happening, that I, I got a job with Sinclair for a number of reasons. The one I have in mind specifically right now is that there was a certain way of going about things at Sinclair, which I haven't seen anywhere else. Okay. So you had a guy at the top who didn't know a little about a lot, or about a little, he knew a hell of a lot about a hell of a lot. Okay. <coughs> Always with an eye on the future, seeing what the chip manufacturers, Franti or whatever, are thinking about going down there, influencing their ideas possibly. No, you'd always have the clout of high volume manufacturer without high volume manufacturer. That was really interesting. interesting. Um, and it was really trying to design things as economically as possible. And for me, because it was my first job out of university, I just thought that's how it was for everybody else. But it wasn't, because as you get to understand how engineering and manufacturing, you realise a lot of other products, like at the time Apricot, don't you remember that, it was a fabulous bits of product design. And you look at the tooling, staggeringly expensive. You know, the industrial designers were allowed to do stuff that we weren't allowed to do. Um, you know, and the consequence of that is you either have a product that's not as nice or you don't have as much scope in what you can do with the shape and the detail of the product. You know, I talked about connector holes. Really difficult. You wouldn't think so. You know, but there's a, every connector hole around any Sinclair product, there's a story. I can tell you about it for half an hour. You know, it's just, they're, um, they're quite tricky when you're restricted. But coming on to your question, the, um, yes, because sometimes I'd meet people that were what you might call military hardware designers. And they're not really, through no fault of their own, they're not really, they're not really had to address um, making more than 10 or 400 or 1,000 off. You know, they never had to think in terms of, we're going to make 10,000 a month. Um, we're going to make so many that one mold still isn't enough, we're going to have to make four molds or that sort of thing. Um, they don't use processes that are for high volume manufacture. They use processes that, uh, are expensive, clumsy, and uh, very expensive. And I think you possibly like modern software. You you probably use a lot more information than you need. Um, if it's there, you 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 will take it. You've got six billion gigabytes. You're going to use it, aren't you? But if someone says, look. Is the next simple, simple, or whatever, 500. Um, you've got 8K RAM to run the thing on. You're going to come up with some really smart solutions. So, um, elegant solutions, reliable ones. So, yeah, having your back against cost. And it's not just the number of cost elements, there's the tooling cost, okay, or origination cost. There is the manufacturing of those parts cost. And then there's the assembly and test cost. Obviously, they all work together as a cost and add up to a big, big sum. Um, I think we might be out of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well,